There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. All right, guys, I'm just going to fess up right now. The uh, audio quality in the upcoming interview is less than desirable for sure. Um, what I did is this was a remote interview with Michael Batiste of the Elk Calling Academy, and the content is really good. Uh, he's got he's got some great stuff to talk about, but I screwed up the way that I plugged my microphone into my recording software. And to be honest with you, I'm just I'm not a sound engineer, man. But what I did, I ordered a new microphone so this never happens again. Um, and I, I've been kind of going back and forth. This episode's late because I've been I've been going back and forth with whether or not to release this or go to Michael with my hat in my hand and say, "Hey, man, uh, this this recording didn't turn out great. Can we redo it?" But um, I think that what I decided is I'm just going to go ahead and release this because the uh, the microphone that Michael was using was really good and it turned out pretty good. So. Really, people want to hear what he has to say in this. My side of it is is pretty funky. It's hard to hear. Um, we talk over each other a lot. There was like this weird delay. Uh, I edit it as best as I can. And I think that there's enough good stuff that Michael has to say and, and some of the stuff about elk calling and, and strategies and, and the elk calling academy and stuff that we talk about is, is, is pretty good. So I'm just going to keep it and roll with it. I uh, hope, hope you guys bear with me. So welcome to episode number two of the Western Huntsman podcast. This, uh, as I said before, is with Michael Batiste of the Elk Calling Academy. Um, Michael is a uh, got a lot of experience and started a company called the Elk Calling Academy. And it's uh, where you can, you can sign up. It's a Patreon page at elkcallingacademy.com. And for like 15 bucks a month, you get a wealth of information that is just never ending. He's posting videos all the time. Um, whether you want to, if you want to learn to call or if you want to um, talk about elk behavior and elk hunting strategies specific to September hunting, uh, this is the dude to follow and listen to. It's uh, There's a lot of good stuff in there and he, he does a really good job. He loves teaching. So he loves, he loves uh, sharing his knowledge and experience and getting everybody uh, pumped for September, like, you know, that's just uh, part of what we do here. So um, I'm excited to kick that off and get that going. Before we get into the interview, I wanted to, as as part of the, the, the concept of this show, kind of go over a quick little fact that I found online uh, and, and kind of show you guys how to create arguments against these anti-hunting organizations that, that throw out these they throw out these ludicrous statistics on on their their websites and and whatever advertising they're doing. They throw out these crazy statistics that it's not like they're a hundred percent false. It's that they're twisted. They're they're spun. You know, it's they they spin it into into making it sound a lot worse than it really is, or uh, whatever they're whatever they're trying to achieve with that. But um, it's funny because two different groups. One of them is uh, everybody knows PETA, right? PETA is People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. They're kind of a fringe group. Uh, they throw out a bunch of wild and crazy statistics on their website and, and have some just obscure, crazy ads they put out uh, to the public and, and demands and stuff. The other group is called In Defense of Animals. Both of them, they cite this uh, study that was done on whitetail. Basically, what they imply is archery hunters only kill and recover 50% of the deer that they hit. And the, the way that they put it um, and cite this study is super interesting because it's it's actually it's not true. You guys know that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna break it down for you. So first I'm gonna read the I'm gonna read this right off the PETA website, Pain and Suffering. It's under Pain and Suffering on the PETA.org website. Many animals endure prolonged painful deaths when they are injured but not killed by hunters. A study of 80 or I'm sorry, a study of 80 radio collared white-tailed deer found that 22 deer 
who had been shot with traditional archery equipment. Eleven were wounded but not recovered by hunters. Okay, so they're essentially saying half of these deer just go pain and suffering, and, and it's it's just horrific as all hell. Okay, the other one on In Defense of Animals, which is IDAUSA.org on the campaigns page. Uh, one of the paragraphs, it, it reads as followed. Quick kills are rare, and many animals suffer prolonged, painful deaths when hunters severely injure but fail to kill them. Bow hunting exacerbates this the problem. Uh, evidenced by dozens of scientific studies that have shown that bow hunting yields more than a 50% wounding and crippling rate. Then it goes on to say some hunting groups promote shooting animals in the face. I've never seen a hunting group promote shooting an animal in the face. Never have I seen that. Anyway, getting back to this. So the in defense of animals uh, BS that they're, they're writing on this website, what you want to focus in on is evidence by dozens of scientific studies that have shown that bow hunting yields more than a 50% wounding and crippling rate. Guys, that's, that's BS. First of all, there is not dozens of scientific studies and the, the, the site that they're using to actually get this information from says that the study that they're referring to that they reference is a study called wounding rates of white-tailed deer with traditional archery equipment. So it's specific to traditional bows. Uh, if you're a trad hunter, um, and, and it's, it's not, it's not one of those, uh, tear apart hunting kind of studies. It was actually done by people of the department of zoology of Oklahoma, cooperative fish and wildlife research uh, unit in Oklahoma university. Oh, I'm sorry, Oklahoma state university. Let's see. It's all basically in, out of Oklahoma, um, and in the study was done at the McAllister Army Ammunition Plant. And here's another key fact. The study was done back in the mid to late 90s. So, I mean, we're talking it's it's over 20 years old. This is an old study. And PETA and this In Defense of Animals uses this as if it's just some fact that was there's dozens of studies. There's all this shit that's out there on this. It's just not true. So evidenced of, uh, by dozens of scientific studies, not true. I've, I have searched high and low. <clears throat> there are not dozens of scientific studies. When you look back at the actual study where they, that they reference, it says, the very first paragraph says very clearly, it has been speculated that wounds acquired during the hunting season are a major source of mortality for white-tailed deer. Yet existing information often is conflicting or based upon conjecture rather than science. In addition, data designed to determine the fate of wounded deer is difficult to obtain and is virtually non-existent in the literature. So there you go. The, the one way you can interpret that is this is an isolated study. And the study, I'm going to get into this in just a second, but it's a, it's a very isolated study. There's no collective amount of data out there that proves that any kind of archery hunting accounts for 50% of wounded deer that are shot and not recovered. It just doesn't exist. Okay, and then getting into the actual results and dis results and discussion of this study, I'm just going to read it to you. I, I mean, it's it's pretty clear. They the the way that they PETA and um in in defense of animals, the way that they misinterpret this is is pretty clear as you read the results section of this study. Uh, which if you were to if you were super curious and wanted to read this study, wounding rates of white-tailed deer with traditional archery equipment, just Google that, and it'll pull it right up. Uh, it did for me. So during the study, 22 of the 80 bucks with radio collars were shot by archers and 11, 50% of those deer were recovered. Of the 11 deer that were wounded but not recovered, three died from their wounds, resulting in a wounding loss of 14%. So in defense of animals, 50% wounding and crippling rate, the way that they put that is not consistent with what the study says. 14% wounding loss mean only three of them died. The rest of them are just flesh wounds. You know, everybody's done that. We've, we've been out, we've been out bow hunting and, and uh, whack a deer or an elk or something right in the shoulder. And it, it's like nothing even happened to it. That thing just goes. The pain and suffering thing on the PETA website, many animals endure prolonged painful deaths when they're injured, but not killed by hunters. What I'm going to say about that is, I am not saying that that never happens, that uh, somebody wounds an animal, whether it's archery or rifle, it doesn't matter. Somebody wounds an animal, and it does happen in which it's it's a fatal wound. The hunter can't find him. 
um, to put it down, it's a, it's a prolonged, painful death for the animal. But to suggest that many of the animals and this big, huge ratio of traditional archery hunters, 50% of them are only wounding these animals, is, is not consistent with the facts of the study that was done over 20 years ago. So what they're doing is, I'm going to give you an, an analogy here. What they're doing is, let's say that there's this town in small town America, and it's growing. Maybe there was a, a manufacturer that moved into town, and um, now all these people are moving to the town. The town is growing, and it's expanding outside of the, the normal boundaries of, of the town. So they're putting in some new suburbs, um, new developments on the outskirts of town, and the increased traffic out there makes it necessary for the city to go ahead and add a stoplight at this intersection where for years and years before it wasn't busy enough to worry about having an intersection in a red light uh, with stop and go traffic. So now they put this, this stop and go traffic light under this intersection. And let's say it's got like a blind hill coming down on the east side and a blind corner coming around from the south. And it, it creates the circumstance just by the very nature of its design. It's a dangerous intersection, right? There's uh, one or two car wrecks a week and maybe one fatal car wreck a month on this intersection because of the nature of how this was designed. So in the context of how PETA and indefensive animals would, would compose this to the general public, in their opinion, they are going to essentially say that every intersection because of this one intersection, right? We're talking about this one made-up intersection that uh, I, I just mentioned and, and and has all these car wrecks, right? Every intersection in the United States of America and Canada is uh, fatal and dangerous and should be done away with because of the high level of danger. That's how they're going to present it based on the facts that they presented with the with the whitetail study. They took it out of context. They 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 went back over 22 years to find a barely relevant study to cite and reference on their stupid website and they think that that's going to pass that's guys this is so easy this stuff is so easy to debunk it's not even funny i can go on all day with those uh with uh, just getting on those two websites so that's just one of the things and i just wanted to highlight that as uh we get this show rolling and get it uh get it growing and and moving off the ground and everything i just wanted to highlight what we're up against why it's important for us to be on top of it and why a couple of snippets here and there on on this show may help you guys out as as we deal with this so so there you go here we are only like 10 minutes into this thing and we've already taken apart the one of the one of the most widely spread little wannabe facts of PETA and indefensive animals and their groups and we've be um, we, we were able to debunk it right here and prove right there within the study that they reference on their site that it is just total and complete bullshit all right so um all right let's get back to this uh this interview with Michael Batiste coming up here it's uh it's a really good interview uh Michael has a lot of good things to say he's a he's a great teacher um I encourage you guys to jump on elkcallingacademy.com and I'll I'll go ahead and throw it in the show notes for you too and also, by the way, guys, thanks a bunch for all the feedback I got on uh, from episode one with Dirk and uh, the emails I got. All the man that you guys are awesome. I appreciate that. That's it's so much fun to read. Even I, I got one negative comment back, and that's okay. I, I expect that. Um, even those ones are are I like reading that stuff. So if you guys want, send me a shoot me an email if you guys have topic ideas or you, or you know of like some kind of anti hunting situation going on that I should be aware about that we should talk about. Uh, send me an email. I'm at jim at thewesternhuntsman.com. That is jim at thewesternhuntsman.com. Again, that's in the show notes as well. So pretty sweet reading that stuff. So I appreciate that, guys. So uh, getting into this, Michael Batiste, here we go. All right. Welcome, everybody. This is uh, going to be episode two of the Western Huntsman podcast, and uh, today I've got Michael Batiste with me, and I, uh, I appreciate you being here, man. Oh, I'm honored. Thank you for reaching out and extending the invite. Uh, you know, any any chance I get to sit down and talk about elk, you know me, I'm not going to turn that one down. <laughs> me neither. Um, I, I'm glad we see eye to eye on that. So I'm trying yes. something new today. Yeah. With, uh, we're doing this uh, recording with video. And for those of you that don't know, I live I live in the back in the sticks of North Idaho, and so we'll see how the internet uh, goes for us. So should be it's working so far pretty good. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, 
You know, I, I, I've used Zoom quite a bit as one of the tools that I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one lessons, yeah. uh, you know, L calling lessons with students that don't live in the Boise area. And so, I mean, I've, I, I, I've done, you know, use Zoom with students all the way over on the East Coast. And I mean, it always works really, really well. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I might need to sign up for some lessons <laughs> for me because I, <clears throat> I live way up north, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'd like to uh, I'd like to talk a little bit. Just uh, let's cover a lot of ground today. Um, I'd like to talk sure. get, get some background on you, where where this lifestyle of, of elk hunting came from. Let's talk about the Elk Calling Academy and talk about uh, what's going on with you, what's coming up, and and just to have a good conversation. What do you think? It sounds good to me. Just lead lead the way and. I will answer whatever questions, topics, or this or that you throw at me. So, well, for for people that don't know you, uh, you're from Oregon, right? Yeah, Hermiston or something. So yeah, I mostly I, yeah, I mostly grew up in Hermiston, Oregon. Um, you know, and then after I graduated high school, I moved to Lagrand, Oregon, and went to college up in there. And so that that whole Blue Mountains in Eastern Oregon was kind of where my hunting tenure, you know, started. Uh, my stepdad, you know, he wasn't a big game hunter. Um, you know, we did a lot of pheasant hunting together. Uh, so big game hunting while I was growing up was mostly done with friends. And my grandfather uh, was too old to, to really get out and hunt at that time. But he was a valuable resource that, you know, I could always, you know, call him or stop in and, and get information and say, hey, this is this is what I saw. What should I have done? And, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, I moved to Idaho in kind of the mid nineties and I linked up with a group that took me to their hunting spot, which was eight miles back in on a ATV trail. And I mean, it was just incredible. It was one of those first experiences where you're laying in camp at night and you're just hearing bulls screaming all, all throughout this. Oh, it just, it was, it was unreal. And, and that's what kind of got me really interested in, in learning about elk because I was so fascinated about them and, and wanted to learn, you know, vocalizations and behavior and, and just wanted to learn a lot more about them so that I could become, you know, consistent. I had enjoyed a little bit of success, you know, archery hunting on my own just through pure dumb luck leading up to that point. But once that point, I, I mean, it just, you know, so mid nineties, I would have been in my mid twenties. It just became this sickness. I wanted to learn all I could about them and spend as much time, you know, as I could around them and watching them. And, and I want to figure this out. I, I, I want to know what they're doing, why they're doing just to help me learn more. Cause I had seen the statistics and I'm like, man, one elk every seven years. I know, you know, and I had, talked to, I had talked to some guys that they're like, yeah, we've, we've hunted elk for 14 years or this or that. And we've never even seen an elk or heard a bugle. And I'm like, and no, I, I want to increase the odds in my favor. And, and so that's what really got the bug started. On that, on that first trip you went with those guys you, you linked up with, were you guys rifle hunting then or were you actually in, into bow season? No, we were, we were bow hunting. And, and I mean, I was still fairly new to archery. I mean, I started shooting archery when I was 14, 15 years old. Uh, my parents bought me a, a Fred Bear 45-pound takedown recurve. And so it, it was funny because I had a couple of teachers in high school that, you know, I really looked up to and, and one was a trad guy and one was a, a compound guy. Yeah. And it was so funny because sometimes I'd feel like a ping pong ball in between those two because, you know, the trad guy going, man, if you want training wheels, you know, go, go shoot a compound. And, and, you know, then the compound guy was like, well, you know, if you want your arrow to flatline and not arc, like it's going over a hill, you know, and all, just, sometimes it was sitting between those two and just pick up the stick and stir the pot just to get those two jawing back and forth at each other. But, but yeah, so I shot that recurve, um, you know, from about 15 and in, until I was about 19, 20 years old. And then I picked up my first compound and even still my first compound, I still shot fingers and instinctive for the longest time. So 
And then slowly, you know, started putting components on, you know, put a site on and then, you know, this and then this. And, and so, so finally, finally got in. You were in the field with uh, doing that with just your fingers and, and actually chasing elk that way. You're a braver man than me, man. Oh yeah. Fingers, yeah, so. fingers. And in the so, you know, it was all, it was, I think it was that challenge you know, that really drew me into it. And, you know, when you're, when you first start elk hunting, you have kind of these thoughts, ideas, or mis, misperceptions, I guess, you, you know, that you carry out in the field with you and you quickly learn that uh, reality is not the same as dream world. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So, so that was mid nineties and uh -huh come to Idaho, you're, you're in like, uh, you're down in the Boise area, right? Uh, moved to, moved to Boise and, and started hunting kind of, kind of the central Idaho area. Gotcha. And so did you do any elk hunting in Oregon when you were still there? Yes, I did. Actually, my, my first elk hunt was in 1988 and that was pure. <laughs> I, I remember I, I, for some reason there was a family gathering. I don't remember what it was. And, and my uncle had, uh, caught wind that I was going elk hunting and he goes, Oh, he goes, I got this thing. You have to take this. You have to take this. And, and, and he brings out this little pill minder type deal, this, this pill box that, you know, he had, he had Jimmy rigged and, and he goes, what's this? And, 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 yeah. And he goes, goes to make a sound. He goes, Oh, he goes, just a minute. And he runs in the other room and he comes back in and he opens up this condom. And I'm like, okay, if there was any chance of me sticking that thing in my mouth, it's just, it's out the window now. The fact that you're throwing a condom on it. No, I, I ain't putting it anywhere near my mouth. He goes, no, just, and he created this thing that did kind of these, you know, just little cow sounds. Mm -hmm. And so I said, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give this a try. Why not? And, and I, I mean that, that first hunt, I, I go out there and I'm walking down this, this, you know, mountain road and, and I get to this rocky section and here's this wet spot in the road and I'm smelling this odor and I'm like, what the heck is that? And, and I pick up the rock and I smell it and it's like, ah, oh, musky. And I'm like, huh? And so I grabbed that pill minder and I probably sounded like a mad, angry Russian cow. Just, yeah! And this bull, just, oh! I'm like, oh, no way. And so I just kind of start in his direction and here comes this bull running my direction. And so I knocked an arrow real quick and I remember the closer he get, the more I'm shaken. And, and you can just, I mean, I'm surprised that that arrow didn't completely fall off the bow and everything, but, but this bull comes up and runs back and forth and bugles another two, three more times. And I, I I'm just so mesmerized with him that I didn't do a dang thing. I just completely froze and just watched him. So you didn't then he lost interest in turn. No, I, oh, I didn't draw. I didn't, I, I didn't do anything. I, I just was, you know, wide eyed and bewildered and was like, Oh, wow, that's really cool. And so he kind of lost interest and turned and ran back the direction he came from. And so, you know, I sat there for, you know, five minutes and my emotions kind of calmed down. And all of a sudden I was like, Oh my God, that was the coolest thing I've ever experienced. Wow. I, I want more of that. And so I started walking the way that he went and I walked maybe a 150 200 yards and hit that pill minder box again and he immediately bugled and and I still had an arrow knocked and he came trotting in again and this time I held my composure drew back and I, you know zipped him at about 16 yards and then watched him run over and fall over he goes and and I'm like huh this isn't so tough I mean I'm <laughs> 45 minutes, an hour into my first elk hunt, and here's a bull on the ground. And so I go up and I get him out, and I'm like, okay, it's not that far to the road. I'll just grab his horns and just drag him to the road and throw him in my truck. And well, I went to pull, and he didn't budge. And I was like, uh oh, we're going to have to take this in smaller pieces. So, I mean, just, you know, pure, pure dumb luck, being in the right place at the right time is, is basically, yeah. you know, what it was. So. Yeah, but. I think that happens to everybody at some point. I haven't had like just pure dumb luck yet. So we're, we're going to see, <laughs> see at some point it's going to get me. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, you're, you're right. It, it, it does happen to, you know, a lot of people and you know, a lot of times it is just being in that right place at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been, um, you've been hunting elk ever since. And now, yes. uh, for those of you that don't know, Michael has, um, a, a company called Elk Calling Academy, 
and right. you can get on a, and we'll talk more about that as we get, we get into this, but you do private lessons, you do uh, videos on a Patreon page and um, gear mm -hmm. reviews and all sorts of cool stuff. It's actually, it's actually a wealth of knowledge. Uh, so I'd like to talk about that Thank a little you. bit here, here down the road. Sure. Let's talk about, we, we had, uh, you did a video, it was uh, when you were still doing the Wapiti Wednesdays and yes, you brought up some stuff about uh, things going on in your marriage. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. In fact, that was one of the first or one of the last Wapiti Wednesdays, you know, that I really did on YouTube. So, um, you know, I'm just as guilty as I think a lot of other people are that, you know, sometimes, you know, we really, really get tunnel vision and, you know, we really lose sight of that, which is around us. And basically, you know, what had happened was, you know, I kind of got stuck in this deal where I was selfish and neglectful. And, and, you know, I was so focused on, you know, what I was doing and my wife would come to me and she's like, Hey, I just need, I just need some more time. And she, she would always joke that, you know, she's like, you know, Michael with you, you have two seasons, you have elk season and then you have getting ready for elk season. And I used to laugh and go, ah, oh, you know, that's, that's funny. And, um, but then there towards the, towards the tail end as that kind of started progressing, she started joking. She goes, you know, maybe I'm just going to go online to your booking page and, and I'm going to, I'm going to book a slot or two just so that I can have, you know, time with you. Cause you know, I, I mean, it was, it was lessons. Wednesday nights were Wapiti Wednesday Q and a, and I remember, you know, we would have discussions and she would bring things up and I'd be like, but I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this to give you the life that you want, that you ask for. And, and, you know, I got prideful about it too, you know, cause she, you know, I remember she came to me and she's like, Hey, you know, will, will you read this book? And I was like, I don't need a book to tell me how to have a successful marriage. That's ridiculous. You know, male pride, male ego. We don't even read directions when we buy something to put it together. Why would I read a book on a marriage? Yeah. So, so, I mean, ultimately we ended up getting divorced. Um, and you know, for season last year. Yeah. The divorce was final September 4th. Um, and you know, September really, gave me a lot of time on the mountainside to really reflect on everything and really look at everything. And, and since I've shared that video and what I was going through, I mean, I always love helping individuals. That's why I started out calling Academy. And one of the reasons I decided to do that video and share what I was going through, because I was like, you know, I bet you there's others that are in the same position that are in the same place that by maybe me sharing can help them in their situation and avoid what I'm going through. And I had a bunch of people reach out and start messaging me and I got on the phone with people and, and it's, and it's funny because, you know, people would be like, well, you know, she's always nagging about how I'm going and setting trail cameras or doing this or doing that. And, and I'm like, is she nagging? Is she really nagging? They go, what do you mean? I said, is she nagging or is she giving you a playbook on how to make her happy? And they're like, oh, well, we didn't think about it that way. And I was like, so what's, what's one of the things that, cause I remember, I mean, here's a couple examples, you know, from mine we used to love going for drives in the mountains. Mm -hmm. We would still go for drives in the mountains, but I always had the video camera. I was like, Oh, I have to film this video or I have to do this. So it wasn't that focused, yeah. you know, attention. So I mean, looking back on it and, and now I, I mean, I miss those drives so much and, you know, we, we are talking quite a bit and, you know, I have made a lot of changes. I realized the faults that I had and, you know, corrected those and she sees those. And that's, that's one of the things that I've talked about. And I was like, God, you know, we communicate better now than probably we ever have 
since we were married. And that's, that's because there's some things that I did that I had to let go of that I was carrying as baggage, you know, from my past from, I mean, years and years ago, but, but one of the other things too, is something so simple. I mean, atomic fireballs loves atomic fireballs. I always have a little Ziploc baggie now of atomic fireballs in my truck. What is an atomic fireball? It's basically, it's like a cinnamon hot jawbreaker. Those little candies? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought you were talking but, I mean, about it's, like some kind of shock or something. No, no. It's, it's just a little candy, but it's something small like that. I mean, another example is I know how to country swing dance. She doesn't. And she used to always come to me and say, hey, I would really like to... You know, I tried teaching her in the house and she's like, well, maybe we should go someplace. And I said, yeah, we could do that. And I said, you know, this place does it on Wednesday nights. This place does it on Fridays. Well, Wednesday, I always do Wapiti Wednesday. So let's go to this place. Mm, I don't like that place. Well, fine, whatever. I, I gave you an option. You know, there was two choices. I, I, I gave you an option. You just didn't take it. A couple of weeks go by. Hey, I really want to go. Great. We can do, you know, since I have this on Wednesday, we can do this on Friday. I I don't like that place. No. Well, once again, I'm trying. You're you're just not working with me. But in reality, all I had to do on a Wednesday night was say, you know what? I'm not going to do a whoppity Wednesday night. Let's go to this place that you do like, and let's take an hour an hour out of my evening, or one night away from Elk Calling Academy, mm-hmm. and go do something that was important to her. And I have a new slogan that you know. I kind of live by now in regards to her. And that's basically, if it's important to you, it's important to me. Yeah. I think that's, well, and it was, it was never about the hunting. Hunting was never a problem. In fact, I hunted a lot more when we first got together and were first married than I did here in the later years. So it was never about the hunting. Mm -hmm. It was just that equal amount of time. And, And like she said, she goes, I didn't want the world. I just wanted you know, a little piece of it. And she goes, and I didn't want to be your number one top priority. I just wanted to feel like I was a priority. And, and that's one thing that we talked about was in, in, instead of priorities, which is a pyramid type shape, we, we talk more like a mobile, you know, where you have something in the center and you have all these other things that are revolving around that center, but they're all of equal importance. Not one's getting more than the other. And, So, yeah, a lot of these guys that I've talked to and and hearing what they have to say and discussions they have with their wives, it's it's amazing how simple and easy. And I I have heard back from some people that have said, man, thank you for sharing and thank you for talking. You have saved my marriage. Our relationship is better now than it ever has been. And so the ability to share what I'm going through and what I've learned to help others uh, has just been amazing and rewarding. And I don't know what tomorrow holds with us. Um, I'm just going to keep fighting for for today and and see what happens. That's good. I think a lot of people can take some lessons out of this um, in your situation. And and like, cause, cause the one thing you didn't mention is, you know, you're doing, you're doing your videos, you're doing Wapiti Wednesday and and then gearing up for hunting season and private lessons. You also have a full-time day job. Right. I mean, yes. So, I think a lot of us, I, I know when I was, when I was first married, I made some huge mistakes in regards to hunting season. And uh, I mean, I would, I would leave my wife for, for several days at a time and be up on the mountain and not talk to her. We had little babies. Uh, it was a wrong call. And so I, that's kind of what I wanted to ask you is, is what kind of advice would you offer somebody who's uh, maybe they're engaged or they're, they're a newlywed and you know, they're hunters. They're like us. That's, that's, we, we're either gearing up or we're hunting, you know? Um, yes. What, what kind of advice would you give somebody like that? So first off the book that she had asked me to come read, I have read that plus several others. And, 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 and it's amazing what I've learned from those books. But one of the books that I, I, I read talked about recreational companionship. And what it does is it talks about doing things with your spouse that is of similar interest. Well, sometimes in a new relationship, it's hard to find those similar interests. Mm-hmm. And you can Google this. It's called His Needs, Her Needs, 
recreational companionship worksheet. And what it is, it's this worksheet that has got a hundred or more activities. And it has ranking negative five, negative four, negative three, negative one, zero, one, two, three, four, five. And it has husband, wife. Mm -hmm. And so what you could do is you could print out two copies of that and you each sit down and you go through and you rank those activities of, of how important they are to you or how you feel about them. And there's lines on the back that you can add some in. And then what you do is then the two of you come together and you share your scores. And then over on the right, you have this tally line to where you can tally. So now anything with a score of three or higher is, or no, four or higher is one of those things that you both have a similar interest in. Sure. Now, obviously the higher ranking ones, but what this is, is this is a great way to find activities that you both have interest in that you both can do together. And it's, it's, it's amazing that taking a little bit of time and doing some of these things with your significant other, with your spouse or with, or, you know, this or that, how doing those things throughout the year actually have the potential to open up the door and give you so much more time during your hunting season. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's actually, gosh, it's funny, man. The entire year is, I basically give that to my wife, right? Yeah, she, she does, she does all, um, all the planning and we, we do trips and I don't, I don't go on the road for work uh, generally without her uh, and the kids. Cause we, we actually homeschool. So when, <clears throat> when I have to, I have to leave town and, and go to a, a work conference or something like that, you know, I, uh, she jumps in there. She, they, they all go with us. The kids learn something and, and we're not apart. And, and I used to think it, it kind of in a selfish way, well, I'm, 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 I'm working on building up my hunting time capital. Right. And right. But the, I think that the missed point that I, I got out of this is like that just having that time with my wife and my kids throughout those months where it's not hunting season, it, 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 it we have a strong marriage and, and we, uh, we connect better, we communicate better. And so, yeah, no, that's that's really good stuff. And so, it, what does a balanced marriage look like to you, as as a with with keeping hunting in mind? What what does that look like to you? Well, the balanced marriage. I mean, that's that's where I'm talking about. You know, throughout the year, you know, doing things with your spouse, with your kids. Um, you know, so with me, with my hunting, my focus is archery. So, you know, September is pretty much, you know, my time, October, you know, rifle, I would focus on her and, you know, her daughter. And, and, you know, that was their time to go out and spend time with them. But have? yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, and, and, and so the rest of the year though, th there wasn't that support the rest of the year, like you said, was focused on getting ready for season or the lessons or sports shows or this or that. And, uh, you know, she used to go to sports shows with me too, before our son was born. And actually after he was born for a little bit, she went to uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation Elk Camp with me a couple of times. Uh, but I mean, you know, just like this year, so I took off the week of Christmas and I took off, you know, this week, the week of New Year's, which is something I've never done before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, our, you know the, the, the company I work for, we can only roll over so much vacation. And so all that extra vacation, it was either cashed out or it was donated to the community pool. And I was sitting there looking at it this year and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take the week of Christmas. I'm going to take the week of New Year's off because our son, you know, we, we would take our son to a daycare. I, I mean, he's, he's eight, but they have school age kids, but they were always doing field trips. And I'm like, if I, if I have this chance to take off work, why won't I, why not take off work, leave him home. And he and I do our own field trips together. Yeah. Yeah. Build those memories, build, build those memories, build those time. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that she was like, wow, you've, you've never done anything like that before. And so like Christmas, you know, the day before Christmas, we went and watched a movie. Uh, the day after Christmas, we went uh, roller skating or, or roller blading actually, and just had an absolute yeah, ball. And this, this morning I actually went and picked up Sonia and her two kids and, and our son. And so all five of us 
the plan was, was we were going to go to lunch and then we were going to go to a place here in Boise that has a trampoline park, a ropes course, laser tag, mini golf. And we were just going to create these family memories, these, these new traditions. And, you know, we went to lunch and, and Paige just wasn't, you know, feeling very good. And so I said, Hey, I said, if you don't feel good enough, let's just table this for another day. And, you know, both Paige and Sonia like, were like, well, you can still take the boys. And I said, no, I, I, I said, today was not uh, me and the boys. This was, this was all of us together as a family building memories. Yeah. And so let's just, let's just rain check this for another day. And both her and Sonia looked at each other and was like, wow, because the Michael of the old that was so selfish would get upset because these plans didn't go through. And now here you are saying, Hey, you know what? You're worried about somebody else and, 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 and this. And, and, and it was cool because, you know, we got done eating lunch and we get up and we're walking out of the place we were eating and Paige was like, are you, are you sure? And I said, absolutely. Cause like I said, I want this to be a family experience because none of us, well, I think Knox is the only one that has been to this place. I said, none of us have been here. I want all of us this, to experience this. And she's like, wow. She goes, well, hey, she goes, at a minimum, we all got to get, you know, we were all were together and sat down and have lunch together. Awesome. I said, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, but yeah, that's, that's, I, I mean, that's the balance doing things throughout the year. I mean, I know there are people that, and, and I've talked to them where they're like, well, all my vacation goes towards hunting. That's, that's what all my vacation is. Yeah, I know. People okay. Like you know, I understand the passion and this and that, but I, you know, I look at things so much differently now and I'm like, okay, what, what are you teaching your son about, you know, being involved with his spouse or being involved with his kids or now, now mind you, some of these that do save their vacation, they do a lot of things with their family throughout the year. But there are those that, you know, there are those that are extremely, extremely selfish that they're like, no, this is, this is just who I am. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Yep. I know. I know a few people like that and they, I, I it never, it never actually works. <laughs> so no, no. Yeah. Interesting. How with, with all that going on, how did that, how did that affect last hunting season? Cause that, that all, it basically right at the beginning of archery season, final divorce. What did that do to your, your September? So, like I said, I had a lot of time on the mountainside to reflect uh -huh. on, you know, my marriage to reflect on me. And that's one of the things that I really did was really started looking back and going, okay, what really happened? You know, there was, there was a lot of emotion throughout elk season. Um, you know, there was, there was some days that because of heightened emotions that, you know, maybe something didn't go the quite the right way or this or that. And, you know, we may have, we may have taken two different vehicles to get to the trailhead to get everybody there. And I, I remember one night, you know, one evening we got back to the truck and I mean, I was not in a very good mood at all and basically said some things and the other three jumped in the other tr truck real quick and took off back to camp. Come to find out they were in the truck driving back to camp, laughing and joking, going, <laughs> glad we're not in Michael's truck today. <laughs> So, um, but no, it, it, I think it was, it, I, I think it was good that it happened because like I said, it did give me a lot of time to really think and really reflect mm. on a lot of things and really process a lot of things instead of just, you know, being in the hustle and bustle of day-to-day -day life and, and, and just staying busy so you don't really process it or think about it or this or that. Um, yeah. It certainly didn't affect our group's success <laughs> this year. Um, Let's talk about that. It didn't me. diminish the, okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's, there's six of us in camp. There's five other guys that I hunt with. And um, you know, this year we went five for six, definitely could have very easily been six for six. Um, everybody had multiple opportunities. We had probably one of the best years 
that have had in a long time. And, and mind you, this is in a place that is only the second year that we've hunted it. We're still learning this area. And, and to have this success that we did, and, and really, I can't even call it a second full year because last year, you know, we moved camp pretty much almost three quarters of the way through the season into this new spot. So we really only had two weekends to hunt this new spot. We spent some time during the summer going up and scouting and setting trail cameras. And, and, you know, I spent a lot of time, you know, during the winter, uh, you know, doing e-scouting online and looking at maps with tools and stuff. Um, but to actually get out there this year and really set foot in some of these areas and learn these areas and learn the elk's behaviors and habits and, and patterns a lot more, it, it just, I, I mean, we are beyond excited for what the future holds with this spot that we're in now. So there's six guys in your group and yep. um, how'd you meet all these guys? So Bryce and Brandon, father and son, those are two that have hunted with me uh, for the longest. And, and I met them years ago through kind of a mutual friend. And, and, you know, I remember talking to Bryce and he had another hunting partner at that time. He's like, yeah, we've, we've elk hunted for five, six years and we've never seen an elk or heard an elk. And I'm like, all right, you guys are going with me next year. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you guys, you know, how to do this. And, and so we went out and, and just kind of formed that bond shit or that friendship and that bond. Now there was a time, there was a few years where I was really involved with you know, bugling bull game calls and the DVD series and the Explorers Big Game Journal TV show that I didn't have a lot of time to hunt with Bryce. Um, so there was there was a little bit of gap to where, you know, we didn't get to hunt and, and we kind of linked back up five, six years ago, four or five years ago. Um, but that was one of the, and then I mean, you know, Eric was mutual friend. Uh, Chris is Eric's friend that brought him. And in fact, those guys last year, uh, Eric contacted me and said, Hey, my, my area just, you know, is on fire. I can't have access to it. And I said, okay. I said, Hey, uh, you, you know, we kind of branched out into some new area. Here's the deal. I'm going to give you some coordinates of areas that I've scouted online. You guys go hunt that. I'll hunt this area. We'll compare notes at the end of the year and we'll either come over to where you are or you'll come, you know, join us. And, he went to that area the first week weekend and it was New York city. I, I mean, they had people park in their camp to go walk through their camp to a trailhead. And so I gave him another place to go. And, and, you know, the first morning there at that Chris shoots and, and Chris was brand new to archery last year and Chris shoots his first bull. Mm -hmm. And so then those guys joined us full time this year. And then Kelly was the new addition this year that I've, I've known Kelly through 3d archery shoots you know, for a few years. And we had another guy that was, was hunting with us and we kind of, you know, let him go out of camp and invited Kelly. The reason I like six is because we go out in groups of three. Yeah. I was going to ask you, how does and, that work with six people? You know, how do you guys, how do you guys do? We go out in groups of three. So because three people can get an elk off the mountain pretty dang easily in one trip. Yeah. So, um, so you know, we just, we, we break up in groups of three and, and, you know, we talk about it and going, okay, where are you guys going tomorrow? Okay. We're going to go here. And, and, you know, we have all these different spots that we jump to. So we're not routinely going into the same spot day after day, after day, after day, after day. So, I mean, we, you know, that's, that's why, you know, my approach has kind of involved or, or evolved over time. I mean, when I, when I first moved to Idaho, like I said, we were eight miles back in, in the Canyon. Yeah. And you know, now, now, mind you, we had that whole canyon to ourselves. Um, but as, as, as time kind of evolved and, and, you know, the introduction of wolves and, and the popularity of backcountry hunting, I kind of changed my approach that I really don't pack back in anymore. You know, I, I base camp from a truck, um, but we'll use that truck that, man, if we need to jump in the truck and drive 40, 50 miles down a gravel road to go hit a different drainage or something to go hit a different group of elk to leave all these alone. Mm -hmm. we, we certainly do that. And I think it's really, I don't know, it's, it's, it's been interesting because it, it forces us to broaden, you know, when we're looking at elk country and really find Versus multiple different areas. Yeah. Cause back country, I mean, you're kind of pigeonholed into that one area that oh. if something happens in that one area, especially if you're eight, nine, 10 miles back in. Yep. Yeah. 
you're there, especially if you're a guy that only gets one week of vacation a year and you only have this 10 day window to hunt. It's, it's a commitment. Now, now let me tell you backcountry hunting back, you know, going back in and getting a bull down and getting it out like that. It's incredible. It's, it, it is rewarding. Um, you know, in fact, we were joking about that this year. It's like, God, you know, I kind of miss that backcountry camp when we're laying there and we have bulls screaming within a hundred yards from camp. And God, two nights later, we had a bull come off the mountain behind our camp and he sat there and bugled within 150 yards of our camp all night long. It's like, Hey, I guess all we had to do was say something about it. And a bull would come, you know, we could sit around the campfire and bugle at that bull and get him to respond almost every single time. Yeah, that, and that, that's one of the things that you miss when you're not in the back country for sure. But I'm like you, man. I I I, I don't want to get pigeonholed in, in, into somewhere, but there is a mystique with the back country hunting that, um, and I haven't done it in years. And I think part of my problem is I kind of did that a lot in the Marine Corps, except for we weren't hunting, you know. And so I get I get sick right. of living stuff, you know, out of out of a pack. But with you guys, yes. so <clears throat> you split up in two groups of three. And then do you guys yes. have like a designated collar, designated shooter, and and maybe somebody filming or something? What what do you how do you break that down? So, you know, early in the year we kind of set it up with, you know, collar and two shooter scenarios. Cause a lot of times early in the year, you know, elk aren't real vocal. You're you're a lot of times just doing blind calling that you don't know the direction that the elk are gonna come from. Mm-hmm. And so normally, you know, we'll do two shooters to where the collar is right in the middle between the two shooters. And, you know, that collar will pay attention to what they're hearing and adjust one way or another. So, you know, they're really, really high chance that a bull is going to walk by one of those shooters, no matter which direction they come from. Oh, yeah. and, and that's all part of, you know, choosing your setups properly to force them to come into those areas. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things that, you know, we talk about in the Elk Calling Academy is, is how to, you know, set those up on the tutorial videos. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, we'll normally do that. And then as t- tags start getting filled, you know, then it turns into designated callers, uh, you know, spending time on the camera. I mean, I think the second weekend rolled into camp and, and Chris and Eric, showed up and I said, well, I don't know when Bryce and Brandon and, and, and Kelly are getting here. So let's just throw camo on and go. Let's, let's just go. I want to check out this spot. We haven't hunted it yet this year. And, and let's just go in there and check it out. And I, I mean, we were in there 20, 25 minutes and, and Eric had an air ownable. Oh, really? So, oh yeah. Yeah. It just, I, I mean, we had barely, we had barely got into the area that I wanted to check out and, and honestly, I was, I was just basically, I had done a couple of cow sounds and a simple locate bugle. And all of a sudden from the opposite side, we just, we hear the brush. <laughs> so, there is no way. So we set up right there. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, break down Eric's bull, get it off the mountain. We get back to camp, Bryce and Brandon are there. We hang his up. And so Bryce and Brandon and I go out the next morning up into an area that, you know, the three of us had really been hunting and, mm-hmm. We get into four or five different bulls and Brandon ends up shooting one Saturday morning. And so pack that one off the mountain. And so, you know, Brandon has been around me enough that I've never worked directly with Brandon, but he's always listening when I'm talking. And so he had a chance this year to do a good majority of calling out in the field. And then I had that ability to basically say, okay, you know, what did you hear? What did you do? How did you respond? And, you know, really talk through those. So it was in the field training, which was excited because he got a ton of experience and a ton of opportunity this year. That's awesome. We've got kind of a delay. You know, kind of a what? A, a delay between, uh, between us here. Yeah. I kind of see that right now. That's, that's okay. We'll, we'll get through it, but we'll no, it, uh, you know, and then like Eric, you know, he, he, he shot that, that bull and then, yeah, I, I remember when we got up for the long hunt, because normally, you know, we'll hunt weekends and we'll pick a week or two and it's like, okay, here's, here's our long hunt. But we got up there that Friday on the, on the long hunt and Eric pulled into camp about five minutes after I did. And, and I said, I don't know when anybody else is showing up. So Eric, you have two choices. You can either stay and wait for them or you can go with me because I'm going to go up again. I'm going to go up and check out this new area that we haven't gone into yet this year. I said, but if you're going to go with me, you're going to pack the video camera. And he's like, okay, not a problem. 
And so we go up into this area and dang it, if I did not come so close to sticking a 326 by six that night with Eric running the camera, showing me doing one-on-one, you know, with a bull, no collar, just how I move, how aggressive, you know, all this stuff. And so it it just, it it was a great opportunity, but, but no, I, I'm truly blessed with the guys that I hunt with. Was that that video? What's that? Did you put that video out? Was that the one where that calf was kind of coming in on you? Yep. Yep. That's that's that one. Yep. The big old bull, huh? Yes. Because I don't remember. Yeah. That. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it's not the best footage. I mean, Eric's never really ran camera that much, but you know, the yeah. fact, and, and that's one thing I am really, really fortunate about with the guys that I hunt because there is, there's no egos in the camp. There is no starlets there is none of that we all are just good friends that enjoy the camaraderie there is a lot of trash talking there is a lot of food and in fact bryce bryce and i we went and shot bows a little bit on saturday and that's one of the things we were talking about is like okay we need to kind of get the calendar out and get everybody together before season and say okay you're responsible for dinner this night you're responsible because what it was is is if we were going to camp for four days everybody brought enough food to feed everybody in camp for all four of those days so there was there was definitely oh there was an abundance of food so um but that's the other thing that i like about base camp too because I mean, we were having T-bone steaks. We were having chorizo street tacos. I mean, you know, we were having these meals that you have that ability to have with a base camp. Beats a mountain house any day of the week. Dehydrated meals in the backcountry. I'll tell you what, though. Uh, peak refuel has really kind of changed the game on on backcountry meals. Uh, peak refuel and next mile meals have, oh, have really, knows. really kind of... Uh, change the game a little bit. Oh, the peak refuel is phenomenal. And and we still will take some of those to camp because there are nights that, you know, maybe you get a bull on the ground and you're late getting off the mountain and, and it's like, hmm. but that's the other advantage of hunting with the group that we do too, because if three of us are late coming off the mountain, the other three got back to camp earlier and they already had dinner ready by the time you roll into camp. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's uh, that, that uh, the food is another important part for me when it comes to the base camp. Cause I usually have my wife and the, and the kids yes, up there and uh, you can tell just by looking at me, I like food and my wife is a, <laughs> a damn good cook, man. <laughs> so what, what would you say uh, some important lessons from this last season uh, you got out? Did you, did you get any, any key takeaways from this season? Um, something you learned, something new? Um, yes. Don't be afraid to just go to a new area. Um, prime example. I mean, I've looked at this one area ever since we switched over there last year and I've looked at it on the map and you look at it on the map and it looks phenomenal. But then when you actually physically see it, you're like, there won't be any elk in there. I I mean, just look at the way it's facing and how the vegetation is and, and, and no, and we actually hiked in there this summer on a quick scouting trip. And I don't even think we walked in a half a mile before we were like, this is junk. Turn around and we just walked right back out. But that's that area that we focused on towards the tail end of the season. And there was probably a dozen bulls. I mean, all in all, probably 100, 150 head of elk in that area. It in, in broke out in different herds and different groups. Nice. I, I mean, just all nice. over the place. And it was like, I would have never, ever guess this. I mean, I had the gut feeling, the gut feeling, that little voice was telling me, you need to go check this area out. And I think that's one of those things too, that, you know, we all have those gut checks. We all have those, those gut feelings and, and, or that little voice, whatever we want to call it. Listen to that voice. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of times where I've just discounted it or ignored it or this or that, but listen to that little voice. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid, you know, find solutions. I mean, we were up on this, this ridge top and looking down on the backside and, you know, we threw a bugle off down in there and had a couple of bulls bugle and it's like, ah, but you know, if we drop down there and this and that and trying to get it back out and, and I mean, it would have been a nightmare and all of a sudden it's like, well, no, wait a minute. 
there's six of us that regrouped right up here. Not all six of us have to go. Five of us can drop off down there. The sixth can grab the truck and drive the truck all the way around and meet us on the other side. And we'll just hunt right down through it. And so that's what we did. And I mean, great encounters. Some of the elkiest habitat have ever gotten into. I I mean, just, it was amazing. And now all of a sudden we're like, hey, you know, we can go the night before and drop a truck off here and three of us can take the truck up here and we can go up over the top and do this or we can put the truck here. And so had we not dropped off or taken that chance, we would have never found those areas or found what yeah. was down there. And, and and we got to looking at it and, you know, we bumped into a couple of other people and you know, it, it's amazing. And everybody we ran into this year has hunted this area for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. And it's like amazing that have didn't see you guys last year, haven't seen you up until this point, but you've hunted it for as long as you've been on this earth. But I'm like, are there areas that you guys won't go into? And they're like, oh yeah, we'd never go up in there trying to get something out of there is just, you know, impossible. It's like, well, don't tell us it's impossible. Because we will find a way say, you guys to get it out. Even, be on that. <clears throat> You'll be on that like a drunk on free. Oh, <laughs> even, oh, hey, exactly. I mean, even if we have to pull out a map and go, okay, we're going to we're gonna have to drive 80 miles from the truck to really access this to make it you know, possible to get this elk off the mountain in time and not worry about spoiling meat. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one thing that sets us apart is – we don't look at an area and go, no, we can't go in there. We'll never get it off. It's, it's always, cause that's what we're always looking at is what's the quickest way we can get this elk off the mountain so that we don't lose any meat. Cause that's yeah. the biggest thing. I mean, we're working our tail off for that meat. So we definitely want to save it all. For sure. So yeah, we're always, always looking now, mind you, there's been times that Bryce and I have been on a ridge top and we've heard a bull bugle without even saying a word we just bail off that ridge and go after it. Cause we've always had that mentality of let's just get him on the ground and then we'll figure out how to get him off the mountain later. Yeah. Well, that has put us in, that's put us into some nasty, nasty packs. Um, I mean, you're talking two day packs, three day packs just to get him off the mountain. So now it's like, okay, let's work smarter. Let's, now that you have on X and you have all these tools that you can be right there in the field, pull up your phone and look at a map and quickly get a game plan together to get in and get out quickly, safely, and easily. Well, not easily. It's still work, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's never easy, but yeah, I, I hear you. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I feel Although like- that, that bull that. Go ahead. Well, I, was, I, was, I was just going to say that that bull that Eric shot 25 minutes in, that one was an easy pack. Yeah. It was 203 yards, 203 yards to the truck on a soft sloping finger ridge oh, wow. that then only had steepness the last 15 yards down to the road where the truck was parked. Man, that's cheating. Isn't that cheating? Heck no. <laughs> With the nasty packs I've had, over the years, I'm going to take those. I'm going to take those chip shots like that whenever oh, I can get up. Yeah, that's uh that's funny. And what you were, you were talking about there with um, not being afraid to try new areas and, and, and some of the things like that taken out of that last season I had, I was finding elk in places I would never expect to find elk in. I, you know, the, just against the, um, what, what everybody says where you're going to find these elk, you know, and, and it's hot day, North facing slopes. Well, I kept finding them on South facing slopes on a hot day. And that was, that was an odd thing uh, for me this year, but what uh, I wanted to ask one thing for, for new elk hunters that are, and you, uh, in your case, you can't give away too much unless they're, they're getting on that uh, elk, elk calling Academy. But what would you say are three of the biggest mistakes that elk hunters make, you know, and they don't even have to be new. Uh, I know a lot of hunters, <clears throat> they've been doing this a long time and they um, sometimes like, like I did for a long time, never learned from my mistakes. So what, what are three big mistakes that elk hunters make that lead to tag suit? Sure. So I, I think a big one is unrealistic expectations. Um, and, and I hear from a, I, I hear from a lot of people, especially people that don't live in elk country. And I, I hear from a lot of them, especially as backcountry hunting becomes more and more popular. And 
you know, they'll be like, hey, okay, four of us are are traveling 26 hours in the vehicle to go to this place. We are packing in nine miles for 10 days and we're going to shoot four bulls. And I said, I love the enthusiasm, but let me tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. That's unrealistic expectations. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, okay, let me just kind of paint a picture of reality here. The four of you are going to get in your truck and you're going to drive for 26 hours. You're not going to have a problem with it because the excitement level is going to be there and you're going to get to your trailhead. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you get to your trailhead, you're going to be so exhausted from the time in the truck that you're going to have to spend that first night on the trailhead so that you have enough energy to get you and your camp back in 10 miles. Then you're going to take the 10 miles back in and then you're going to set up camp. Now another day is wasted. Then you're finally going to start hunting. Well, the elk aren't exactly where you thought they were or where you expected them to be. So now you're going to have to hunt and go find them. Well, that's going to take another two, three days. Now you're five days in and you don't have any bulls on the ground yet. So now you finally find the elk. One of you actually managed to get an arrow in the bull on day six. Now, the fact that you've never really broken down an elk or don't know what it really takes to get one off the mountain now you just spent the rest of that day, maybe the next day, getting that bull off the mountain to your spike camp. So now you're at day seven. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've got to figure out how to get that bull and all your gear back to the truck. Well, maybe it's a little warm. You don't want to take the risk of that meat being back there in the back country. So you need, you need to get it to the trailhead so you can get it to town and get it on ice or get it in a meat locker. So by the time all this has happened, you're at day nine of your 10 day hunt, or you may get back in there and you spend a couple of days hunting and there's not even a fresh track at all in this whole entire canyon that you're in. Well, now you're going to have to tear down camp. So, you know, back out to the truck to get in the truck and go find another trailhead to go to find out. Well, because of that first trip, 10 miles back in five days of your 10 day hunt is gone. Mm hmm. Easy. And then by the time you get back, yeah, you get back out to your truck, you go to the next trailhead, you go seven, eight, nine, ten 10 miles back in. Well, again, now you only have a couple of days to hunt this new area. And, and so, so I think it's, it's, it, it, and part of it, I think is, you know, and I've talked to so many people that they're like, Oh, I just went on my first elk hunt. How did it go? It wasn't what I was expecting. Well, what do you mean? Well, I watch all these YouTube videos and these guys go out and they bugle and they have all these bulls bugling. And I said, okay, you got to understand on those, on those little 15 minute YouTube videos or these hunting shows that you watch, you got to understand that what you're seeing and what you're viewing is the highlights. It may have taken 14 days to get enough footage to put that 15 minutes together. Yeah. I always say it's that on those videos, you're looking at 1% of the hunt. The, the, on, on a lot of yes. those, you're looking at about 1% of the hunt. If, and, and like, yep. like you said, it, these guys might come from, from back east and hike five, 10 miles into, into a basin and find out there's seven other camps in there and no elk. And it, it, that's, that's yes. a great one. <clears throat> Unrealistic expectations. I love that one. So I think another one is, is being afraid of change. Can you say that one more and, time? And what I mean by that, being a being afraid to change or make changes. Okay. And what I mean by that is, is here's a couple of examples. First one is I, I've got a buddy that he called me. He's like, what should I do? And I said, well, what's going on? He goes, I've hunted the same area for years and years and years because of my family, but the elk numbers are diminishing and it's just getting harder and harder to find elk. And I'm like, is there a question within that statement? What should I do? I said, if it was me, I would go move to a new spot to find elk. Yeah, but the memories of this place. And I said, what's more important to you? Tied into these memories or finding a new place and creating new memories? Yeah. So I think some people just get so tied to a spot that they're just, they're afraid to move because they're like, well, man, I've taken all the years to learn this spot and I know where the trails are and I know this and I know that. And, and it's like, 
okay, I get it. Then maybe that becomes a summertime camping spot so that you can relive those memories. You can still tie into those, Mm -hmm. but go move to a spot where there's actual animals. The other thing is that ties with this is changing your strategy. I mean, one of the things that I talk a lot about at Elk Calling Academy is the breeding sequence. And I remember after season, I spoke to somebody that is a member that has been a member for a long time. And they're like, okay, I have a confession to make. And I said, what's that? I tried your breeding sequence. I said, great. How did it go? And he goes, yeah, it didn't really work. I said, okay, explain your season to me. He goes, well, he goes, we were doing our same old normal thing that we always do and we weren't getting any responses. So we decided to try your breeding sequence one morning and we tried it. And then we went back to just doing what we always did because nothing happened on the breeding sequence. And I said, oh, okay. How long did you try the breeding sequence? Oh, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And I'm like, Mm. yeah. Okay. So you, you spent the first several days of the season doing the same thing that you have always done that has not netted you any success at all. You learned something new. You only tried that for 15, 20 minutes, and then you went back to doing the same old, same old. How did your season end up? Just like all the others. Surprise. Not much elk encounters. Yeah, not much elk encounters and no punch tags. Okay. Well, again, what's your question? <laughs> well, should we have tried the breeding sequence longer? Have you watched the videos? Yes. What do I talk about in there? At least an hour. So I think you just answered your own question there. Yeah. You, you have to be, and, and, and I think that's another big mistake that people don't have is having patience. And, and patience when elk hunting is, is key. You, there are times you really, really have to be patient because that you have to give that bull a reason to come in. You have to basically coax him or entice him or because you can't make up his mind. You can't force him to do. The only thing we can force elk to do is run away. Mm-hmm. That's about the only thing we can force them to do. Um, and that's where patience comes in. And I, and I think patience is another is another key element that a lot of people struggle with because they want to force the situation. Is that going to be your third biggest mistake is, is lack of patience? Yep, third, third. Yeah. You know, and, uh, God, there's so many, I, I mean, I mean, we could do go more knowledge. If you want to keep going. Oh, I, I mean, there's, there's so many, but yeah, patience is one uh, knowledge, you know, knowledge of, of elk behavior and elk vocalizations. And, and, and I mean, prime example, all the years of going to sports shows, you know, demonstrating a call and, and, you know, throw off a bugle and you have those people that have, you do that in my area and elk just run the other way. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. We're yeah. going to have a conversation because I want you to expand on this. And, and, and what it is a lot of times is they just get into a bull that is heading from feeding to a bedding area, but that bull's bugling as he's going. Well, in their, their mind, it's like, well, he's just running away from me because I bugle. Uh, no, the fact that he continues to bugle back, he's basically telling you, hey, we're heading this way. Come join us if you want. You know, come follow us. But but I think that's, you know, understanding the vocalizations, understanding, you know, their behavior, knowing what to say, when to say it, and, and all that stuff is is another big mistake. It's funny you say that uh, about the uh, people that talk about how the using a bugle is going to scare the elk. That, that exact thing happened to me. I I was I was up on up on one of these drainages that I hunt, you know, and I had just had a great encounter with an elk. And we had the longest conversation. He was so mad. He was so worked up. Um, and it was, a, it was one of the situations. He, he, he comes out of the brush and sees me draw my bow. And it didn't, like, totally scare him off, but he was unsure enough that he turned around and casually walked, started walking back up the mountain and was just screaming at me the whole way. Anyway, this, this uh, encounter went on for 20, 24, uh, 20, 30 minutes. And then when I, I walked the two miles back down to my truck, and this guy was kind of driving by and he saw I was carrying a bugle tube and he kind of slows down and rolls his window down when I get back to the road. And he's like, you might as well just leave that tube in your truck. There's too many wolves. They're not going to bugle at you. Literally, buddy, less than an hour ago, I was I had one screaming in my face. So I, I think that's a, that's a good one. Yeah, I, I mean, 
there's just so many examples. I, I, I mean, I don't know how many times, you know, during a year that, you know, Bryce and I, or, or any of the guys, you know, we're heading back to camp or this or that. We run into people and, you know, it's like, Hey, how's it going? They're like, we haven't heard an elk or seen an elk. And we're like, God, we're in elk every day. Yeah, um, you know, one of them though, it was funny. It was, it was a couple that was camped right at the start of a spur road. And I remember, you know, we stopped and, and chit chat with them and the gal was like, I don't understand it. We were up here this summer and there was just tracks all over this place. And now all of a sudden, now that we're here, there's, there's no elk. And I'm like, huh? So there was tracks right here on this road all summer long, which told you elk are living here. And now that you came as humans and set your camp right here where the elk were living all summer long, and you can't understand why those elk have disappeared. <laughs> Good luck figuring that one out. So, But sometimes it's, it's just those common sense things. Uh, Cause that's one of the questions I get asked all, you know, a lot is, is, you know, how close to elk is too close to camp? Well, yeah, that's there's definitely. so many factors involved in that, you know, that's a tough one to answer. Yeah. That's uh that's going to be totally regionally dependent too. I mean, there's, there's time I've had elk walk through my elk camp in the past. And so oh, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's switch gears a little bit there. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I, we got this delay. So I, I feel like I'm oh, nope. cutting you off. Um, no, we're good. We're good. Let's, let's, let's switch gears. So we were talking about the three biggest mistakes that elk hunters make. What, uh, here's a scenario that you got a new hunter. He's never hunted elk before he or she, uh, what would be three things that are kind of key things that he or she should focus on as they get ready for September Because we're coming up on January. They've got, they've got about nine months to prep whether they're coming from out of state or they're, you know, they've just, this is going to be their first elk hunt, uh, archery hunt. What, what would be, what would be your three biggest things you'd advice wise? Knowledge, knowledge, learn all you can what, about the elk. What, what, what do you mean by knowledge? Like elk behavior, elk habitat, oh, elk- behavior, vocalizations, you know, what they like to eat. Um, the area that you're going to hunt, study it on a map, you know, get on the phone with the wildlife biologist for that area, ask questions. I I mean, there's so much knowledge that you can get that's readily available that I I mean, I I look back when I started, there wasn't YouTube, there, there wasn't videos. I I mean, videos were just barely getting started with, you know, Dwight Chu and and Larry D. Jones and those guys. And, and the access to information today is, is just tremendous. It's 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 awesome. Oh, it's, it's, it's readily available if you're willing to just put in a little bit of time to learn that. But, but knowledge is, Number one. Number two, always have backup plans. Again, we talked about it earlier, getting pigeonholed. Um, you know, this is one thing that I talk to students and, and you know, doing lessons about. And, uh, you know, some of these students will send me GPS coordinates. And one of the lessons we do is me dissecting their spot. And I'm like, great. OK, where's so that's plan A. Where's plan B? Where's yeah. plan C, E, F, G, H? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, OK, let, let Let me put it this way. You're coming from back east out to Colorado. You have this one spot. You have this trailhead in mind. This is where you're going to hunt. What are you going to do if you drive all that way and you get to the trailhead and there's 12 trucks parked at that trailhead? Which is a very high probability. Anywhere you go. But again, it's one of those things where they're like, I didn't think about that. Huh. So... Uh, yeah, always, always have a backup plan, always have a contingency plan, you know, and I, and I think the third thing kind of goes back to kind of the first mistake. It's, it's come out with realistic expectations. It's like, you know what, what would we may not get expectations you in your mind? Well, just know that, you know, your first year, the chances or odds of you actually getting an elk are very, very slim, but the chances of you gaining knowledge and experience is tremendous. But also too, I think when you do that, you no longer focus on punching that tag. You focus more 
on the journey, on the experience, on the time with your friends, that you soak all that in. You know, I think that's one thing right there that we could put in a big mistake or, you know, in this one also is so many people focus so heavily on punching that tag or notching that tag or, or the animal on the ground that they miss so much of the journey throughout their time. I mean, the sights, the smells, the sounds, I mean, everything associated with it. And, and again, that just goes back to the group that I hunt with that I'm extremely fortunate about that, you know, I, I think that's why, because we all do partake in and enjoy on that journey, that it's not just about punch and tags for us. It's, it's that whole camaraderie. It's the development of friendship. It's, it's the experiences that we're having that camaraderie on the mountainside, especially when you've been getting kicked in the teeth for a couple of days by elk, that camaraderie is just one of those things that just keeps you going morning, day after day. Great day. point. Yeah. Great point. I think you're right. A lot of people, they miss that. They miss the the point of getting out there and, and having this Western adventure chasing these elk. You know, it's, man, it's just, there's something, whether you get one or not, that is a memory you will never forget. And, and it's just amazing. Make sure you guys are enjoying it when you guys are out there. I mean, it's, it's so important. And, and there's so much to enjoy. You know, and, and some of our, our fondest stars. memories, yeah, yeah, some of our fondest memories are more about encounters than actually, you know, notch tags. Um, I mean, some of, those, some of those close encounters just ingrain such a larger memory. Um, because I think part of it is, is because there's always lessons to be learned. There's, there's always, you know, always evolving, always learning. And, and, and I think too, is we're the type of group too, that no matter what happens, we're always going to find something positive that we can take out of that situation. We can take out of that, you know, out of that encounter or something. There's always something positive. There's always something we can learn. And, and yeah, I mean, we, we have a couple you know, we had a couple of elk this year that with arrows that oh, were tough, tough, tough track jobs. I mean, one of them, one of them was a, a, a liver shot bull that ended up all six of us getting together and, and, and really making that thing happen. I mean, we ended up, you know, recovering and getting them and getting them off the mountain, which was, you know, Chris's second bull. And, nice. and, and, and I mean, that was that was, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the guy's second year elk hunting, he shoots a spike the first year, and now he shoots a five-by-five five branch antler bull his second year. I mean, he's two, two for two starting his career. That's awesome. How old is he? Uh, 26. So he's a younger so, guy. He's got two bulls two years in a row. That's awesome. Congrats. Yeah, just, just in only a second. But, you know, it was awesome because I, I, I remember – you know, those guys, once we got into a place, because there are a few areas where we hunt that we do get cell coverage and we can kind of, you know, communicate back and forth a little bit. You know, they sent me a message and, and it was like, hey, we're on this blood trail. And I was like, OK, you know, what, what where did the hit? Where was the hit? How far are the shot? What's the blood? You know, all this stuff. And and, you know, they were telling me, man, it was right behind the shoulder, right behind the shoulder, right behind the shoulder. And I'm like, OK. And so once we finally you know, found the bull again and finally put him down. And, and Chris is sitting there going, that is not where the shot was. I said, are you sure? He goes, no, I was right. By. And I said, watch this. And I took that front leg and moved it way back. And I said, so was his leg forward or back when you shot? And he goes, honestly, I never looked. I said, so see if his leg is all the way back here and you're right behind the shoulder, where's your shot? And he goes, right exactly where I hit. I said, exactly. I said, but here's the cool thing. Moving forward, you're always going to look to see if that leg is forward or back. You will never, ever make that mistake again. That's a great, So, but that's just, great. you know, and that's one of those things right there on the mountainside. A yeah. quick little lesson, a quick little, okay, what can we learn from this? How can, how can all of us together here learn this? How, how can we all use this to go, okay, I need to pay attention, not just is he completely broadside, is there any brush, but is that leg forward or is it back? Or, you know, if it's back, I need to wait until he takes one more step. Patience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again. Yeah. That, that, uh, exactly what you're saying, that, that bull I was telling you about that, that busted, busted me drawing my bow. 
You think I'll ever do mm-hmm. that again? I probably will actually. I'll probably do it again, but I'm going to be a lot more cognitive about what that bull can see when he steps out of the brush. You, you know what? Honestly, though, it, it, it's one of those things that I don't care how much time you spend out there. I don't care how much experience you have. I don't care how much success you've had. You are still going to make mistakes. It's part of the game. And every year it happens to where Bryce and I will end up doing something and we will look at each other and go, you idiot, you knew better. Why did you, you know, or why, what were you thinking? I wish I so, only did that one time a year. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm being very, very generous by saying only one time a year. There's no, there, there are mistakes, but that's, that's all part of it. I mean, that's, that's, you know, part of what that whole experience that we were talking about. I, I, I mean, if it was just easy and you just checked all the boxes and everything went right every single time, I mean, okay, there's six of us. We only need six days and all tags are punched and our season's done. So um, that's still pretty. Those are some pretty good stats, though. Your group going out, getting, going five for six. Yeah, and like I said, it should have been six for six. Uh, the the sixth guy actually stuck a bull in the shoulder 30 minutes after light on the very first morning. Um, that bull ended up being fine. And then on the very last night, he sung an arrow, sent an arrow high uh, right over the back. So, I mean, you know, first day of this hunt, or first hunt, last hunt, you know, he had shots on both days and, and he had opportunities. And, and in fact, that was one of those things where we were in camp. We still had a couple more days to hunt, but we're sitting in camp and he's like, oh, you know, my confidence is just shot. And I said, if you're looking for somebody in this group to pat you on the back and go, it's okay, you're going to be fine. You're in the wrong camp. Because we're going to tell you to suck it up, put your big boy britches on, get your butt out of bed tomorrow, and let's go at it again. It's part of hunting. It happens. So, what um, I want to I want to just uh, switch gears here again. How okay. would you describe your life as a hunter to someone who is totally opposed to hunting? They live in like a large metropolitan area. They've never been hunting before. Uh, they want you to stop hunting. Uh-huh. How would you describe yourself to them? And and, and what hunting is to you. So, and in fact, you know, that reminds me of, of a few years back, I was at a gas station at a, uh, uh, a mountain town. I was fueling up and there was a couple in their car on the other side of the pump. And I'm just sitting there minding my own business. I start pumping the gas and all of a sudden I hear murder. And I kind of look around and, I looked at them and they were both looking at me and I'm like, I'm sorry. Was that at me? And they're like murderer. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So I said, you know, why do you say that? And we just kind of started having a conversation and they, and they were definitely anti hunters. Um, they had grown up eating meat, but then, you know, kind of went away from eating meat and went into a vegan lifestyle. And, and, and so just kind of started, you know, talking to them and, and I didn't focus on the harvesting of an animal or taking a life or this or that. I focused more on, you know, the experiences and really what it takes to, you know, day after day of watching the, watching the, you know, the daylight crack across the ridge and the, you know, in the, in the East and, and hearing the forest come alive and the sights and the sounds and the smells and you know and of course they they quickly went well you don't have to go out and kill anything to experience that and i said you're right i don't i said now one of the reasons i hunt is because i really like to provide for my family and my wife has something that's called sarcoidosis which sarcoid is an autoimmune disease that also affects the lung but it's treated with protein. Protein is one way to really treat sarcoid. Huh. Well, what's the purest form of protein? LB. Wild game. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, so I'm talking to them about this and I said, but here's the thing too. Every time that I sit down to a meal from this, this animal, I said, now, mind you, you know, when we harvest an animal, you know, there is congratulatory high fives and hugging, but that's not the first thing that happens. 
the first thing is, is we drop to our knees, put our hand on that animal and we give thanks. Yeah. And yeah. that takes place first. The respect for the animal takes place first. You know, then, you know, we go into it, but also the camaraderie that's built with, you know, getting that animal off the mountain and the process of, you know, providing, you know, for your family. And I asked them, I said, okay, I said, you guys are vegans. Do you grow a garden? Of course we do. How do you guys feel when you sit down to a meal and everything that you're eating right there is something that you planted a seed, you nurtured, you grew, you harvested, you prepared, and then you enjoyed it. And they're like, oh, it's just, it's a tremendous feeling. I said, now you understand the feeling that we get as hunters when we harvest an animal and we are feeding our families. Oh, I like that. So it's, it's the same sense of pride. It's yeah. the same sense of accomplishment. So, and I said, you know, I, I said, I know that there's this misperception out there that hunting is just, you know, getting out of your truck and grabbing your six pack of beer and walking up the mountain as you drink one and, Oh, there's an animal and you shoot it while you drink another beer. And then you, you know, you get it off and you know, you leave your empty beer cans on the mountain and that's, that's hunting. Take a picture with a no. cigarette hanging out of your mouth and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I know that, that is, yeah, there, it, it, exactly. It so, real, but it was, but what was interesting was by the time I got done having the conversation with this couple and mind you, like I said, they grew up meat eaters, mm -hmm. but had transitioned to vegan because of information they were given from an individual. And they were like, you know, we never took the time to really understand what hunting, you know, we just had these false perceptions or false information that was given to us. And because of that, we formed our opinion of it without really doing research or knowing or this or that. Ultimately, it was funny because the husband says, you know what? I haven't had a steak in 12 years. I'm having a steak dinner tonight. So they actually opted to eat meat again. And, and I told them, I said, you know, that's great. I said, However, a lot of what you go to the store and what you buy is so injected with hormones or this or that. And it doesn't matter if it's poultry or, you know, whatever. Or, yeah. I said, or, you know, going out and harvesting it yourself is, is, like I said, just like you guys doing your same thing with the garden. And what's interesting is I read an article right before hunting season that says a lot of the millennials – that are so conscious conscious about where their food comes from that are, they're actually getting into hunting. Yeah. I've heard because that. they want to know exactly yeah. where your food comes from. Yeah. And so. that's, that's actually, um, that's, that's super, <clears throat> it's actually, it's good news. I mean, that that's, that's what we need. We need this, we need this younger generation to get involved and get, get into hunting because uh, there's a lot of people like the people at the, the, the you ran into at the gas station that are starting to, the, that movement is growing and hunting is growing it is. at a much slower pace. And so that's, um, yeah, and they're, they're doing it for the right reasons. Absolutely. They want, they want organic meat. Hunting is about the best way to do that. Oh, absolutely. And I think, well, you know, one of those things is when you, when you have conversations or you have encounters with, you know, somebody that doesn't necessarily agree with your viewpoint or, you know, your lifestyle, I think it really matters how you approach that. You know, if, if you approach it calmly to have a conversation and discussion, I think it's going to be much better received than versus, you know, automatically going on the defensive and going with well, you tree hug and liberal, blah, 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 you know, going on the attack. Um, I, I think it's more how you approach it and how you have that conversation. Wouldn't you say in the end, it would be a lot more fun to have poured sugar in their gas tank while they weren't looking? <laughs> You know, I, I mean, yeah, it, it, it does. It does make the blood boil. By the way, it, it, it really does. That to anybody, don't go out there and do that. No, I know. And, and, and I get what I, I get what you're saying. But yeah, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things. And you see it all the time, you know, with people on social media and they're like, hey, I need help. I'm really being attacked. And you see some of these, you know, individuals that 
are bad mouthing us for killing animals, but yet in their next sentence, they're talking about coming and killing our children. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And it's like, oh, so, so you're okay with killing my children. You, yeah, you have a problem with me killing an animal, but you're okay with killing my children. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. But those are the individuals that no matter what you say or what you do, you, you're not going to persuade them. So it's, it's one of those things that choose your battles wisely. And it's like my grandfather used to always tell me, never argue with an idiot because people that are watching the argument will have a hard time of figuring out who the real idiot is. Yeah. Well, that's actually some sage advice. <laughs> I like your grandpa. Yeah, no, what the, <laughs> about, uh, that those, there, you have, see, in my mind, like any, any real committed anti-hunter is kind of a fringe uh, kind of belief system, but they might look at me like I'm, I'm a fringe belief system, but then you've got, you've got, you take it to another level. Like PETA, I believe is a fringe of the fringe belief systems. And, and they're, they're so extreme. They're never going to be swayed. And that's why in, in our way of life and, and, and what we believe, we just have to be, you know, we have to be united in this, in this and, and, and what we're doing moving forward with it because they're, they're, they're definitely, they're definitely coming for us. So, um, what what would one message oh, be absolutely. you feel every outdoorsman um, should always have in the back of their minds? What would be a good message to leave people with? And, and it doesn't have to be in terms of anti-hunting movement. One message to always keep in the mind. Uh, you know, leave the forest better than when you found it. Oh, I like that one. Or even not the forest. Just whenever you go outdoors, leave it better than what you found it. Cool. I like it. What, what is uh, What's your favorite way to prepare an elk? Or you horse? know, lately, it, lately it has been Mississippi pot roast. Okay, you're gonna have to. And so what you, do, so what you do is is you take an elk roast raw and you put it in a crock pot. Mm-hmm. You sprinkle one packet of ranch dressing mix one packet of au jus you put a whole stick of butter over the top of that and then you throw in a bunch of pepperoncinis and then you just turn that crock pot on low and let it cook for eight hours that sounds delicious and so what it does is it breaks everything down and all these juices mixed with that ranch dressing that au jus and then you take some shredding forks and you just shred that roast and let it sit in that liquid Nice. And then basically you just grab some tongs and you can put that over noodles. You can put it over rice. You can put it on slider rolls. Um, but it is so tender and so flavorful. Uh, it's, it, it's my favorite way to do roasts for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap this up by uh, sharing a little bit about Elk Calling Academy, where people could find you. Um, can you sure. give us, give us like a, a commercial for elk, elk calling Academy? So, you know, let me, let me first talk about how elk calling Academy came about. Cause I think that'll be the commercial here. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I've worked in the hunting industry for about 15 years now. I've worked for call companies. Um, and I've always helped people learn how to call. Um, I didn't have anybody to teach me. It was all trial and error, get started, gag on the diaphragm, you know, read, spit it out, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, a couple of years back, one of the local archery shops called me and said, Hey, we had this guy in here. He's wanting elk lessons. He's willing to pay. Here's his phone number. And so I called the guy and I'm talking to him and, and he says, well, Hey, I'm, I, I'm willing to pay. And I said, no, I've helped people. He goes, no, no, your, your time's invaluable. Your time's important. And I said, okay. Well, I said, well, let me, let, let me just think about it. I'll give you a call back. Uh-huh. And I get off the phone and my son immediately yeah. comes up to me and goes, dad, I want swimming lessons. I said, okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll find you. Ding. This light bulb goes off. We can pay for swimming lessons, guitar lessons, dance lessons, drum lessons. I mean, there's so many things we can pay lessons for there's got to be people out there that will would be willing to pay 
for Elk Calling Lessons. Mm -hmm. And that's how Elk Calling Academy got started. And at first, it was just focusing on, you know, the calling aspect of it, you know, how to get started using a diaphragm read, what all the different vocalizations mean and how to do them. And, and then it kind of evolved into strategies, you know, how I use those sounds out in the field. When throughout the, the rut would I use certain sounds, whether it was pre-rut or peak rut or post-rut or, or this or that, and different strategies that I've learned over the years, then it evolved into, you know, how do I find elk habitat? How do I find areas to hunt elk in? And, and so it, it, it's just, even though it's Elk Calling Academy, yeah. it really encompasses yeah everything um, from, I mean, our brand partners that, you know, we trust in their gear and we use and uh, field test a lot of their equipment. Uh, you know, Black's Creek Guide Gear, Initial Ascent Packs, Scree Gear, uh, 6 a.m. Outdoors, Bendable Products, Game Changer Calls, um, you know, Ready Nutrients. And, and, and the cool thing is, is the way to find us is elkcallingacademy.com. Mm -hmm. And right now it is a Patreon page that it's $15 a month, but you have access to all of the instructional videos. You have e-scouting, selecting a right diaphragm read, how, you know, drills to get started on a diaphragm read to get you proficient with sealing the air and controlling the air and all that all the different cow vocalizations, all the different bull vocalizations. Um, you know, there's strategies out there in the field on, on different strategies that, you know, we do that we found a lot of success with and how we kind of evolve and change and, and throughout the year. There are, um, you know, gear reviews. And, and with those brand partners, there's specifically a tab with brand partners that have discounts mm -hmm. to you know, the Patreon members. And then twice a month, we have a live Q and a session that is only for herd members um, that we do right there on the Patreon page. It's almost like the Wapiti Wednesday that I used to do on YouTube. Um, but now I'm primarily just only doing that for those, for those herd members. Cause one thing when I was doing it on YouTube, I always had to hold information back. Mm -hmm. So now with this for, for paid lessons, kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I didn't think it was fair that I had members that were paying for, you know, one-on-one -on -one lessons that I'm giving them information. And then I turn around on Wednesdays and give all that same information for free. I just, I, I wasn't going to do it. And, you know, I, I remember I, I had somebody send me a message once and it's like, what's the dang secrecy? I just want somebody to tell me this and that. And I said, great. I said, what do you do for work? I'm an electrician. Perfect. Come to my house because I need an outlet or, or I need actually a junction box ran up into the ceiling and I need a combo light and fan installed. Well, I can give you a quote. Well, why can't you just come do it? I, I mean, I don't want to pay for it. Just come do it. And he was like, well, I went to school and I, and I said, what do you think all my years out in the mountains was? That was learning a trade, learning a skill. And he's like, oh, okay. Well, when you put it that way, it makes complete under it makes complete sense. Yeah. So for sure. And you um, guys, uh, you guys do giveaways too, right? We do. We do. We have given away packs. Um, yeah. And that's, that's ultimately, you know, my plan is, so after the first of the year, I'm actually going to build a website for elkcallingacademy.com that will have a new full blown e-course. We'll have a shop. We'll have, um, you know, the, the live Q and A's and, and all that access right in there. And the one deal with the, the Patreon page right now, it's $15 a month. The only option that there is is monthly. Well, there's a lot of people that just want to pay once, just pay an annual fee, be done with it. And yeah, my plan is, is to transition everything over there. And then as that website grows, um, basically do monthly giveaways. And what's funny is the smallest giveaway pack is $160. Yeah, that was a sweet the pack. smallest giveaway that we have. Yeah. Well, no, what I, and, yeah. and pack shouldn't be the word because it was, it was the smallest giveaway that we did was actually a, a bundle of stuff from ready nutrients, but it had a value of $160. Yeah. yeah so it, it, it giveaway stuff. Yeah. I mean, and, and just from yeah, packs, bows, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I want people to know too, you, you know, just, um, I actually do do that. I, I do. I am one of the, the herd members for your, your Patreon page. And, uh, I, I would, I would shamelessly plug that thing. There's, there's, uh, just a wealth of information <laughs> on it. Um, great videos on okay. different calling sequences and, uh, and it just the, the knowledge that you gain from that and the, and the networking with other hunters, um, it, it's worth it for me. I love it. I, I can't say enough good things about it. I know we did a, we did an elk calling seminar last year up here in North Idaho. We did, did a, yeah. did yeah. a North Idaho elk calling class for six, six and a half hours. That was, that was a lot of fun. We might have to do that again. You know, I will gladly make the trip back up there. So I know that's one of the things that we talked about was maybe making that an annual event. And, you know, it's it's always cool, too, to to do those and meet people, you know, face to face that you may only know on social media or or this or that. And, and you know, that's one thing that I'm really blessed with, with my time in this industry is is the friendships that have been developed over the years with people. And, and you know, some of those friendships are still just as strong today as they were, you know, from day one. There were actually a um, a pretty decent amount of guys that were in that class that were successful this year. One of them was like it was like opening morning, Good. first first hour of the day, opening morning goes out and whacks a I think it was a five by six, uh, sweet bowl. So yeah, no, that's uh, yeah, that's good that, stuff. That was Dennis, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it was Dennis. I think that, that was his name. Yeah, and I, I remember I posted something and, and that's. And, that was like, hey, whoever whoever puts, uh, you know, proves that they got a bowl first is going to win a read or something like that. And like he was posting his picture of his bowl the same time I was posting that to the North Idaho Archery Group. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so that was that was. Yeah. Cool. It's, and that's one of the things that I get a lot of enjoyment out of is is, you know, I get so much enjoyment out of students finding success. I get so much enjoyment out of my hunting partners, mm -hmm. you know, finding success that, that to me is, is, I mean, especially when it's somebody and it's their first elk and they call you and they're telling you the story that, I mean, you just go back to the first elk that you took and, and, and you get to relive those memories over and over again. But yeah, those are some of the things that I absolutely love. Yeah, that's, I, I bet that is rewarding. That's, that's, that's awesome. So very much so. what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to link, um, there's so much we can cover. We're going to have to do this again, Michael. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to link elkcallingacademy.com in the show notes. And so you guys can, can uh, jump on there and check it out. See if you want to sign up as a, as a herd member, I'd recommend it for sure. Um, and uh, definitely okay. follow Elk Calling Academy is on, on, I know you're on YouTube, I know you're on Facebook, Instagram, anywhere else? Yep. Uh, it, Twitter. I don't do it. I, I don't do a ton on Twitter. Um, I probably need to start doing a lot more, but, but yeah. yeah. Um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram Twitter, are primarily the big ones. Twitter out. You know, I just haven't spent enough time with it, but, but yeah, I know, uh, you know, we're, we're at that time of year now that a lot of the, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of the new flagship bows are hitting. Um, so for those people that have followed my YouTube channel and saw last year, some of those head to head battles that I did, uh, we're going to start filming some of those here really soon again with some of the new 2020 models. Um, just kind of, they're, they're more like a buyer's guide to kind of compare different models and, and they're just kind of fun to do. Yeah. You're, you're a gear junkie, man, for sure. And those are, those are great. Reviews. I am. And, and you know, what's funny is I have shot the whole 2020 lineup and, um, I did not go with a, a 2020 model. Oh, really? For the bow for next year. Really? Yeah. Well, where, where yeah, I chose a 2019. You, are, are you going to make me wait okay. for this to come out? Um, no, but we can stop recording on this and you and I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hey, I, I, uh, thanks a bunch for coming on this. This has been fun. Um, I appreciate it. We, we could, we can probably keep this going for another two hours if we wanted to. So we're going to, we're going to have to do this again. And, and, uh, especially yeah, with everything coming up for sure. So, um, yeah, I would, I would, I would definitely, yeah, I would love to come back and do it again some more. And guys, I, I apologize about some of the, the weird the weird pauses here. I'm going to try to edit some of this out, but we've we've got this delay because, like I, I warned everybody up front, I, my internet out here 
but we're gonna it'll only get better it's gonna get better man it's gonna get better so yep. i appreciate it i appreciate you Perfect. coming on um i'm gonna hit the stop record button here and again guys okay. check out dellcallingacademy.com i'm gonna link it in the show notes and um until next time i appreciate it see you guys later see you guys